My name is Simon Benny. I'm a computational chemist and I work at Nanome. And today I'm going to be presenting some of my old research uh, from my time before I moved to industry. Yep, hey everyone, welcome. We're going to be uh, diving into some enzymes today and exploring them. Of course, I'm Steve McCloskey with Nanome. And uh, yeah, Simon, let's go ahead and dive into the science here. Cool. So uh, this is uh, citrate uh, synthase. It's an enzyme that is involved in, in uh, the Krebs cycle, so part of the main energy pathway in uh, animals and most living organisms. And effectively, what happens, if I move that to the side, uh, if what happens inside this is that there's a reaction that occurs to connect this uh, acetate to this oxaloacetate, and it becomes citrate. And uh, in most organisms, that's just one of the stages in the Krebs cycle. It, once it makes citrate, it moves on to the next stage, and you effectively end up in this cycle. What you can see along this here is this uh, thioester attached to coenzyme A, which is kind of like a, a co well, coenzyme effectively is acting as a, a carrier molecule, bringing components into the enzyme to be um, uh, attacked by various parts of the uh, the enzyme. So the important parts here are obviously this coenzyme with this these nice phosphorus groups over here, this thioester here, oxaloacetate here, and this ASP375, which acts as an electron donor for the process. So the reason why this is interesting, uh, especially within the context of um, agrichem and pesticides, is that it is... Uh, at least in Australia, uh, still fairly common to use fluoroacetate as a precursor to uh, fluorocitrate. And when you add fluoroacetate onto, uh, let's say, rodent nests or something where you want to stop mammalian growth, it blocks the Krebs cycle in those rodents, effectively causes them to have some form of uh, nerve damage over time as their body isn't able to produce energy and it kills them. It can be affected within five minutes. And I believe that you only need around, you need about one milligram per kilogram of mass for it to be lethal. So you only need a very small amount of it for it to be completely lethal to things like rats. Um, and obviously not much of it to actually be lethal to humans. Um, in the context of something like uh, fluoroacetate, effectively what happens is one of these hydrogens over here will be replaced with a fluorine, if I can zoom in. Um, one of these uh, hydrogens effectively after the attack gets replaced by a fluorine and it will produce different enantiomers and these enantiomers have different reaction barriers and that determines the selectivity of the enzyme. So it produces uh, I think around 2% of one enantiomer and about 98% of the other. And as we'll go through the paper, you'll see that there is actually, uh, obviously that preference is measurable when you use something like QMMM, which is a method where you combine quantum mechanical studies with a molecular mechanics force field, so a classical approach. So let me actually now just move the paper forward and show you uh, what this looks like in terms of reaction mechanism. So there are two steps that you need to be concerned about. If I bring this a bit closer to us so we can actually see it. Um, there are two steps, but obviously there are two different um, enantiomers that you can be concerned with. So as I said, this ASP375 has this uh, electron jump onto the fluoroacetate uh, and it does this rearrangement. And you can see here that the fluorine is pointing out of the plane of the paper. A little bit difficult to see, kind of the reason why you want to use something like nanome so you can actually understand the structure. And in the Z um, enolate case, the fluorine is pointing forward. And what ends up happening is you end up with two eventually fluorocitrates, one where the fluorine and the um, alcohol group are pointing in the same direction, and one where they're pointing away from each other. So one of these ends up with a much higher turnover rate. I believe it is this one here that ends up with the higher turnover rate. And we can check that in a second by going through the paper. But let's just have a quick look at them. So I'm going to uh, unhide these two. And let's just move that over there for a second. So this one here, let's see if I hide this. This one is the Z enolate. So you can see that um, 
when you compare this to the paper over here, the Z enolate has the fluorine and the oxygen on the same side of the double bond. So that's there to there. And then when you look at the E enolate, they're trans to each other. And that kind of, well, that, that, that will affect the way that this um, ASP attacks. Now, what you can see here is this little fragment of the residue. And what happens in QMMM studies when you actually want to see uh, a reaction is you have to define a region that is going to be done at a high level, at an expensive level. But you can't obviously leave things uncapped. Uh, chemistry kind of needs hydrogens as almost like a full stop to the chemical sentence. So what you do mm -hmm. is you fix these atoms and then you saturate all of the unpaired electrons with hydrogens. And that means that when you run the electronic structure, it has the correct uh, you know, spin set up, the correct charge, and it makes it easy to do the calculations. When you do it with QMMM, effectively what happens is the rest of this enzyme is then calculated as almost like a cloud of point charges. And they polarize the QM region, so they're kind of constraining all of the electrons by leaving them within an electrostatic field. And you do various steps, and you can see the reaction occur. And this is an interesting uh, process because what ends up happening once you get through this process here is you can see on the paper, you can select different regions. So what we did here is we actually did went one layer kind of more complicated. Um, within quantum mechanics, most people use density functional theory as their, their common method. But uh, effectively, density functional theory um, is a very powerful, very fast tool, and it can be incredibly accurate but it isn't what is often considered the gold standard of QM. And that, that is often reserved by couple cluster theory or CCSD, parenthesis T. And all that effectively means is you're doing a, a wave function method, which is much more, uh, it's kind of more from first principles. You call it an ab initio approach. And um, the reason why you don't do this everywhere is it scales very badly with the number of electrons. So DFT, tends to scale to the power of four. So as you increase the number of electrons, it gets more expensive. And this is why people can't do density functional theory on the entire enzyme. They have to do this cutting up. Couple cluster theory can scale normally n to the seven. So it gets even worse. And the exact answer technically uh, has exponential scaling. So you kind of, within QM methods, you kind of have to pick your poison, you, you say, um, I want this much accuracy, but I only have this much time or this much computer hardware available to me. So in this paper, what we did is we cut up the region even further, and we did what we call projector-based embedding. And this is effectively where within this region, this area here of, uh, of the, uh, the residue and the uh, fluoroacetate is actually all done at couple cluster level. But this moiety, the oxaloacetate, um, is actually then done at um, a DFT level. And just as I said that the rest of this enzyme polarizes the QM region, the DFT polarizes the QM region. So it's kind of turtles all the way down. You're, you're putting things inside each other and hoping that they give you an accurate answer by the end. And, and if we go to this nice set of plots here, you can see why you would do this. So the big thing about DFT that most computational chemists that work in electronic structure theory will say is that you can more or less pick any functional and you'll get some given answer. So this green line here is um, LDA, the local density approximation. No one uses this functional, but you can see there's not even an activation barrier for this reaction here. But then if you pick something like um, Hartree-Fock, which is the starting point for wave function theory, you get a very large barrier. And this means it's very hard to actually understand um, which enolate is selected and which one is going to actually have a preferential uh, rate of production. So this is why DFT is a tricky thing to use. Now, there are most chemists have a reasonable selection they would pick from. They would say, I know that this functional is known to work well within this environment. I've got a thiol, so I'm going to pick this functional. Um, I need something fast, et cetera, et cetera. But by doing our type of embedding, you can see that all of these collapse down to effectively the same answer. And this is the power of doing uh, an embedding method inside an enzyme, that now all the variability of our DFT method has disappeared, and it's become very similar.
And this is actually nicely illustrated here by this bottom plot. So you can see that there are um, the difference between E and Z basically uh, doesn't vary that much, but the total reaction barrier does. So the barrier height is changing depending on what method you use. But when you do the embedding approach, they all sit in this nice space. And you can see that the actual um, barrier difference is actually relatively small. So by putting a high level electron extraction method in, we can understand the preferential uh, re reaction rate for these different enantiomers. So what does this kind of look like at the end of this process? Well, if I unhide this and this, so this is the fluoroacetate and the different enantiomers that are produced here. And you can see um, in these different ones, that the Z enantiomer has a higher barrier than the E enantiomer. And the actual structural difference is, you know, it's just that uh, your fluorine is either pointing in the same direction, yeah, or, or it's pointing in the opposite direction of this uh, water. And this hasn't been minimized. I just made this by hand and used a forceful minimization just to illustrate it. But it gives you an idea how within an enzyme, just small molecular changes can completely disrupt their activity. And actually picking the correct method is really important. So being able to do this in nano, what we can immediately see is that starting from this, um, this uh, citrate synthase from uh, the PDB file, was it 4CSC, there's an interesting um, discussion to be had about the attack mechanism. And then obviously you can actually start doing things like understanding the geometric effect of different enantiomers. Do you have any questions, Steve? Um. Yeah, I've just been uh, observing this. Obviously, you know, you're an author on the paper, so you're very, very knowledgeable on this. Um, so uh, I, I guess when you have that initial fluorine there and then um, you start having these reactions, like I, I guess like um, what is uh, going on? You know, we've been able to do some computational simulations on this. We've seen that like there is some... Uh, I don't know, real world uh, data, I guess, is kills rats if you add the fluorine. Um, is that just because of the the charge or what's the real uh, like mechanism there? So uh, the fluoroacetate acts as an inhibitor of um, actinodose. But uh, effectively, after this step, there's a new state enzyme that's involved in the next stage of the Krebs cycle, and it inhibits the reaction, the activity of that actual. The, the, um, the next enzyme, not not this enzyme. Not this enzyme. This enzyme is effectively what produces this as an inhibitor. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I guess my question is maybe a little bit beyond the scope, where it's like, all right, we model this like in the next enzyme, where it's like blocking it as an inhibitor. So I, I guess. By adding that additional fluorine, like it gets stuck in there and it doesn't effectively, pop out like yeah. it normally would. Okay. Yeah, it, it's it's effectively um, made it so that the next stage of the reaction can't progress. So it's, it's blocking the enzyme activity. So obviously an enzyme causes some sort of reaction to occur and it, it obviously isn't consumed by that reaction by definition. It's a catalyst, a biocatalyst. Um, and in this case, what will happen is the uh, the fluorine, uh, the fluorocitrate, will actually block the next enzyme's activity. Um, it will probably, I say, I don't know off the top of my head the actual activity it takes within the uh, the next enzyme, but it will stop the catalytic activity of this uh, this next stage in the Krebs cycle. And by doing that, the cycle is effectively broken meaning that you can no longer um, actually use the energy from things like uh, sugars or fats, and that eventually causes cell death. Um, I say within 15 minutes of uh, an uh, intravenous dose, it's lethal. Wow. Uh, and it's partly controversial because of that. Um, it's uh, effectively a, a, a very powerful toxin. Um, and there is, up until I think 1990, there was a large uh, question about how this um, this process worked, um, and whether the citronitrile affected things in, uh, in in the Krebs cycle and where. And eventually, it was discovered that it does affect the Krebs cycle through lethal synthesis, which is where you, you're effectively starting with this precursor um, 
here and you're synthesizing the lethal molecule as part of the metabolic process, which is why this is interesting. And, and, and you're doing both uh, the E and the Z in intermarriage. Yep. Like, um, you know, once we, uh, I guess, replace one of these hydrogens, chlorine there, and then um, you know, both are, are sort of produced through this enzymatic process. Absolutely. And let's, um, let's actually just hide the chains for a second here. So this uh, coenzyme here is effectively acting as a carrier for this, uh, this um, uh, acetate molecule. And if, what happens within the mechanism is obviously you start by um, taking one of these, um, sorry, I've, we've got the, um, <laughs> the residue's been hidden here, but uh, this is the stage afterwards. So this um, oxaloacetate sits next to your um, acetyl molecule and it will make the citrate. So this is kind of stage two. But the first stage is using this ASP375 uh, to attack the, uh, the acetate, uh, sorry, acetyl group. And it's then obviously doing a rearrangement. And that's when you get the secondary attack occur to make the different enolates. So you, so from the enolates to make the, um, the fluorocitrates. So you can see here, um, that this double bond, which isn't present here, because this is the first stage. The first stage is using the aspartate 375 to abstract a hydrogen from the acetyl-CoA. This causes a rearrangement that can form the two different enolates, and that's where the second step in the mechanism can form the different fluorocitrate isomers. You can see that the double bond is missing here, as this structure is the starting complex. When you're looking at a crystal structure, you're looking at a low energy state of the protein ligand complex. The computational tools sit here and they tell us what is going on in terms of the reaction mechanism because what you'll be able to do is get this starting structure and then potentially get some product out or do some radioisotope tracing so you can see what is being produced where and hopefully identify you know within what organs it's it's accumulating or anything else and you can understand it but this intermediate this this process within the mechanism isn't really something you can study without a computational tool yeah um, well, let's go ahead and make these these changes real quick. Mind if I do that? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So um, you said that the uh, the big difference was uh, yeah, just replacing one of these hydrogens with the fluorine, right? Yes. It doesn't really matter which ones. It could spin around. So there we go. It's trying to do it now. Um, <clears throat> so the one thing obviously is going to happen is in terms of the electron mechanism, Let's, um, if you unhide the chains, we'll be able to see where this would have come from. So over there, cool. So this is the important one. So one of these uh, oxygens, you know, they're going to be in some sort of resonant structure, but they will, it will donate effectively this, what well, it will steal the hydrogen. <laughs> um, electron hopping is something that as a, an electronic structure person, I find quite, quite difficult to accept, um, but it will effectively steal the hydrogen and you end up with this double bond forming so it's going to um so let's put that in there and if i if if it won't let me do this live what we can do is okay cool um so yeah and then obviously what's what we've got to bear in mind is um this will become a single bond so effectively you get the hydrogen gets abstracted over to here um then you end up with one an open bond that 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 carbon is now unsaturated, so its electron will form a double bond here, and it will kick off an electron on to make this hydroxy group, which obviously is unsaturated again. It doesn't have that um, that hydrogen attached to it. So the next stage would be for this to form a single bond here, and you can see it's kind of happy now. But obviously, depending on what's happening, we've chosen one enolate here. Um, and in this case, it's on the same side as the oxygen. So this would be the Z enolate that you made. And then the next stage of the reaction would be for it to start to interact with this oxalo um, acetate. But the important so part whether is whether this... it becomes the the E or the Z it might be like a momentary difference. Like yeah, if it was yep. which side so... of the bond it was on before it. Uh... Yeah, yeah so let's let's actually order. change this back to what we were on before because I think there's another tool here we can use to illustrate this quite nicely. Um, if I just get the hydrogens back onto it, 
So if you think about how it's going to attack, there are different ways that it could do this. So I'm just going to open up the, the torsion tool. And one thing to bear in mind with, um, with this, this single bond can actually rotate around. So effectively, there's going to be different ways it can have different poses it can take. And as it's moving in dynamically into the system, this is going to be rotating around almost like a pirouette constantly. And depending on what orientation it happens to be in, uh, it will do that reaction. But the key thing that is uh, occurring here is if this um, fluorine is pointing towards the oxygen there, there's a bit more of a steric clash within this. And that's why within the paper, when you look at the plots here, the Z has a higher activation barrier than the E. And that higher activation barrier means that it's there's a slightly slightly more energy that's needed to be inputted to overcome this reaction. So when you think about the starting material for this, this intermediate step, it's going all the way up. It has to overcome the energy barrier. And then it obviously goes past this transition state and it reaches the product uh, over here. And that's You're the important part. Like 17 or so versus this one really caps yeah, out around so, the 15. Yeah. So we can actually see it on the bottom here exactly. Um, 15 versus, you know, about... Uh, what we're we looking at about 15 to about yeah about 17 is reasonable I think um, and that gives you just the idea of like you know it can be in these different orientations but perhaps there's not enough energy uh, in that given confirmation for it to do the reaction now obviously this is boiling things down to a single reaction coordinate right this is a a nice simple way of saying like you know okay we have this um these different distances and this is what happens. Obviously the entire thing is dynamically moving. So in reality, you have all these different variables, which is why before you start something like this, you would do some dynamics on the system. You'd run some MD and you would generate a number of different confirmations uh, of the actual, um, of the actual uh, complex system. And then you, what Mark Vanderkamp did, who is uh, now a professor at Bristol, uh, is he ran these different confirmations and then did some different studies. Our paper took one single coordinate from that and converted it into this uh, projector-based embedding method. But getting over that energy barrier to make the um, the less preferred enolate uh, obviously is less likely to occur than if there's a, a reorientation that occurs and then the reaction can occur with less energy. Nature likes following the lowest energy pathway if it can. Uh, and... This is just a nice example of that with this E enolate and Z enolate example. As I say, this work was done by a master's student about, I think, <laughs> almost seven years ago now. Um, and it was just a nice example of how using a embedding method, you can actually get a very accurate understanding of these barrier heights. And that's actually really critical for designing um, materials that are obviously going to be used within things like pesticides or just generally if you have some sort of reactive event that's occurring uh, as part of a drug design process, making sure that your products uh, don't produce uh, you know, quantities or something that you don't intend is really important. Understanding the barrier heights, mix, and even um, the electronic structure method can be very critical in, in making sure that you produce things that make sense uh, both energetically and, and also chemically. So we got our enzyme here. We have our modified structure with our hydrogen, our hydrogen replaced by fluorine there. Um, you know, once this reaction is uh, done, then we'll end up um, with that fluoroacetate, right, um, or the fluorocitrate, which then, you know, beyond this protein, it goes on to another protein in the Krebs cycle, and then, you know, we'll really block those next steps. And I think it's really cool how you uh, arrange the simulations as well. And we talked about, um, you know, different computational methods, of course, you know, different ab initio approaches you could be doing, their, their benefits and, and trade-offs. But then the day, you know, you might need a, a more simple model like this for some of those more uh, electron uh, intense calculations where every electron really matters. So all the valency of every single atom and you need to you know, look at the shells of um, which electrons could actually interact with each other and build out these you know, huge uh, different simulations uh, you know, based on those electronic properties. Um, you can't do that with the full protein there. But um, yeah, I thought this was really cool that you could kind of go between the uh, the scales of you know, uh, DFT and, and different computational methods. 
um, but then also over and you know go and, and see the uh, full three dimensional structure and really get the, the full context of how these things would all be interacting with each other. Um, but yeah, no, this is a, this is a very cool paper. I uh, appreciate you you going through it and you know showing everyone uh, your work. Uh, Simon is an author on the paper, which uh, not every day we get a hammer that uh, you know is able to, to show off their work. Um, but it's always awesome when we do. But yeah, uh, this has been great, and uh, yeah, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Brilliant. All right, thanks everyone. Bye for now. Thanks, and we'll see you in the science metaverse.